Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Arshna Solanki. Here are the headlines we're tracking this evening. TCS starts the earnings seasons on a positive note. Margins expand to the highest level in three years, even as revenues marginally miss estimates. Deal wins cross $13 billion. A sharp sell-off on the last street wipes out all the gains made this week. Sensex loses over 800 points. Nifty loses over 200 points. Gold prices continue to soar, breaching record highs once again. Prices of silver, copper, zinc and aluminium also hit multi-months highs as hopes of an economic recovery in China boost precious metals. India and Mauritius amend their double tax avoidance agreement in a bid to curb tax evasion introduces a new test to weed out transactions that are solely carried out for the purpose of tax benefits. Tax experts see clarity on the potential impact on past investments and if they will be exempted from this test. Market regulator SEBI likely to exempt few PSU banks and state-run companies from meeting the 25% minimum public shareholding norms by August. Sources say government does not have plans to sell shares in state-owned banks as things stand and they will meet the 25% public float threshold gradually. That's an exclusive. Elon Musk will be visiting India on the 21st and 22nd of April, likely to announce an investment plan worth $2 to $3 billion. Sources say Musk is also likely to announce plans to start satellite-based broadband services in India using Starlink, which is in the final stages of getting a license. Iran threatens to attack Israel to avenge the death of 11 people, including two generals in an Israeli airstrike on the Syria consulate. The US, UK, France, Germany warn Iran of consequences. US asks its employees in Israel to limit their travel amid fears of an attack. US President Joe Biden vows to defend Philippines from any attack in the South China Sea as he hosts Philippine President and Japanese Prime Minister for a trilateral meeting at the White House. President Biden said USA's defense commitments to Japan and Philippines are ironclad. Prime Minister Modi promises to hold assembly elections and restore statehood for Jammu and Kashmir soon. This comes five years after the abrogation of Article 370 when JNK was stripped off its statehood. The United Kingdom tightens visa rules for job seekers in a bid to curb immigration. New rules require an individual to have a salary of at least £38,700, a nearly 50% increase from previous minimum requirements of £26,200. The earnings season has kicked off and TCS has closed FY24 on a positive note. India's largest IT company saw its margins expand to the highest level in three years. Revenues were marginally below estimates, but deal wins were higher, crossing $13 billion. Reema Tindulkar is here with the TCS Q4 report card. Thanks so much for that. So revenue growth has been steady, lower than consensus expectations. The company has clocked in a revenue growth of 1.1% in constant currency terms on a sequential basis. This compares with estimates of 1.3%, but it's similar to the December quarter, which basically implies that there is no pickup, there is no recovery that we've seen in demand at least. But where the company has done very well is on margins. Margins positively surprising, EBIT margins at 26% at a three-year high, improving by 100 basis points on a sequential basis. Deal wins for the company have also been very strong at $13.2 billion. Uh, this is a record high in terms of deal wins, and even for the full year, deal wins for the company are at all-time high levels. North America, for the growth for the company once again has been led by uh, the regional markets, which is basically India on account of the BSNL deal. But if you strip that out, their major market, North America, continues to remain under pressure. North America revenues have fallen on a year-on-year -year basis. Um, you know, communication, BFSI, technology, also on a year-on-year -year basis have recorded a decline in revenue. Headcount for the company continues to shrink. You know, in uh, this is the third consecutive quarter where TC TCS's headcount has come down. In the current quarter, TCS's headcount is down by 1,700 employees. And, um, you know, so that perhaps also explains the reason why the margins of the company have been inching up. Attrition, too, has fallen further, 12.5% in the March quarter, which compares with 80 basis points. So in a nutshell, miss on the revenue, slight miss on the revenues, a beat on the margins, very strong deal wins, and the headcount of the company continues to moderate. Back to you. Thank you, Rima, for that update. Uh, moving on, in an attempt to plug tax evasion, 
India and Mauritius have amended the Double Taxation Avoidance Agreement. The change includes a new principal purpose test. This test is aimed at establishing if tax benefit was the primary purpose of any transaction or arrangement. If yes, tax benefits under the treaty will not be applicable for those transactions. The treaty was last amended in May 2016, giving Indian government the right to tax capital gains arising from sale or transfer of shares of an Indian company starting April 1, 2017. So what changes with this latest amendment? My colleague Surbhi Upadhyay is with, is with the details. Well, the FPI Mauritius tax go seems to be coming back with this latest amendment of the Indo-Mauritius Double Taxation Avoidance Agreement. Uh, as you mentioned, this amendment will now incorporate a PPT, a principal purpose test in the treaty. And by its own, uh, this is not uh, sort of an uh, out of the blue thing. This is part of international tax protocol. A lot of countries are incorporating this principal purpose test in their bilateral treaties. So what's the issue here with India? Well, the issue is all about grandfathering. If you dial back to May 2016, when the first amendment to the treaty happened, that amendment made it very, very clear that investments that are coming into India from Mauritius up till 31st of March 2017, they will remain grandfathered. And that is the big issue. Will this latest amendment now also subject those investments to taxation? The view seems to be, at least the view that the government seems to be taking, is that taxability happens uh, when there is sale of shares. So if the sale of shares is happening after the implementation of the latest amendment, then perhaps uh, there could be taxability. At least there will be applicability of this PPT. Uh, now we've been speaking to a lot of tax experts and they say that if indeed this is the interpretation, if grandfathering is taken away, then that could be a bit of a blow for India because India seen to be a, a stable tax regime and undoing something that was promised several years in the past will not be taken too well by foreign investors. I'd just like to end by talking about the importance of Mauritius as a destination when it comes to FDI or FPI flows. Ever since the First Amendment in 2016, the flows coming into uh, India from Mauritius have actually diminished quite a bit. Uh, on the FDI side, from a figure of over 86,000 crores, the numbers have come down to less than 50,000 crores now. On the FPI side, which is equity and uh, debt capital markets put together, uh, the numbers from Mauritius are uh, sort of still within the ballpark of 4 lakh crores. But other jurisdictions, Singapore for example, they have become very, very big uh, sort of destinations which are bringing in the foreign capital. Investments coming in from Singapore have trebled uh, in the same period, 2017 up till uh, FY23. But having said that, Mauritius is still a very important destination. And if all investments are no longer grandfathered, that could really be ruffling feathers in the investor community. Right. Uh, thank you, Surbhi, for that comprehensive update. Uh, shifting tracks now. Sources have told CNBC TV18 the government has no plans to conduct this new principal purpose test retrospectively. However, source has added that this test will be applicable to investments where a taxable event occurs after this new protocol takes effect. Tim C. Jaipuria is here with the details. Uh, Tim C., what is the government saying on the new amendment? Well, that's right. What sources are telling CNBC TV18 is that the taxability is not retrospective. It is only post the date of the treaty. The provisions will apply to the past investments where taxable event is post the effective date. Also sources say that the bilateral agreement was meant to give effect to the anti-treaty abuse provisions. And after this, now each country will complete the internal protocol and India too will do all of this and India will inform Mauritius and notify the protocol just for the benefit of our viewers. The confusion is because the amendment is silent on the treatment of transactions before April 2017 that were grandfathered. So to this, the sources say that the government is cognizant of these queries that uh, which are being raised right now. But it is important to note that uh, the protocol is yet to be ratified and notified. Thus, when the protocol comes into force, as and when the notification is made, clarifications addressing these queries will be issued by the government. That's what sources are saying. Thus, they say that the government will soothe the nerves before the notification is issued so that there is absolute clarity for the industry on these provisions. So let's wait uh, as and when the government notifies uh, the entire provisions of the treaty. Only then this clarity will emerge and government says that as of now these queries are not warranted also. Go uh, they want the industry to first wait, 
see the notification, see what is there in black and white and then raise questions if required. Thank you, Tim C, for that update. Uh, let's take a quick check of all the market action today. Weak global queues and uh, developments surrounding the India-Mauritius tax treaty spooked sentiment on the last street. Sensex lost nearly 800 points. The Nifty lost over 200 points. Mid-caps also declined in trade. Nigel D'Souza is here with a map trap. Well, a hot CPI print coming in for the United States, that's the one that plagued global markets in today's trading session. The problem is now the possibility of Fed rate cuts gets pushed back further. So at one point of time, the street was looking at a March rate cut. That push got pushed down to June. And now the street is optimistic about September. So that's what's creating some bit of uh, you know uncertainty in global markets. The Indian markets, well, we were shut yesterday, so we had to play catch up on the downside today. Explains why the Nifty went home with a cut of more than 200 points and the Nifty Bank was down 450 points. But the uptrend, you'd have to say, is pretty much intact. Till the Nifty holds on to the 20 DMA, which is roughly around the 22,250-odd mark. Stock-specific action, though, continued today. You had Exide, you had Sinjin, Metropolis. All of them outperformed in trade today. And a blockbuster listing as well, that was a cherry on the cake for some of those bulls and some of those that got allotted that. So Bharti Hex succumbed. Started in the green and, in fact, it went home with solid gains. Now, as results season kickstarts, well, then the investors will keep an eye out on macro data coming out both domestically as well as globally. But the focus shifts to the micros with earnings season, which will give us further direction from year on. Right, uh, thank you, Nigel, for that. Uh, Vodafone Idea is all set to put its much-awaited fundraising plan in action. The cash-trapped telecom company will launch a follow-on public offer worth 18,000 crore rupees. The offer will open for subscription on 18th of April and close on the 22nd of April. The company has fixed a price band of 10 to 11 rupees a share. Last week, Vodafone Ideas promoter, the Aditya Birla Group, pumped over 2,000 crore rupees into a company through a preferential share issue. Japan's Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group is in talks with HDFC Bank's NBFC arm to invest up to $2 billion. As per a money control report, the proposed investment is likely to value HDB financial services at around $10 billion. The talks come ahead of the non-bank lenders' proposed IPO. The MUFG group has been growing its presence in India. Last year, it invested nearly 1,900 crore rupees in Indian fintech company DMI Finance. Goldfrey Phillips, India, with the uh, will exit its retail business division 24-7 after a detailed review of its operations. The company said the decision was taken with the shareholders' approval based on the long-term performance of the division. The exit would be subject to completion of the necessary formalities. The company's India revenue from the retail division was 396 crores in FY23, representing 9% of the total revenue from operations. Its net worth, however, was negative due to accumulated losses. On to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. Market regulator SEBI is likely to grant exemption to some public sector entities to meet the 25% minimum shareholding norms by August. Sources say that PSU banks are expected to meet the public shareholding norms gradually. Sapna Das is here with the details. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Uh, we are given to understand very clearly that some further extension in the exemptions that are already in place for certain public sector banks and certain uh, CPSEs, that's likely to be extended beyond August 2024. And I think the rationale here is pretty much clear. Uh, you know, many of the PSBs, uh, at least four of them, the government shareholding is above 90%. You cannot just bring it down in a jiffy uh, by August 2024 to the 75-odd percent norm. Uh, similarly, for certain other CPSEs, a few of them... Uh, uh, you know, the uh, government shareholding is substantial, at least beyond that MPS of 25-odd uh, uh, percent in the sense public shareholding, but uh, GOI shareholding is above 75-odd percent. So keeping all of this in mind, it's likely that yet another extension is on the cards. Of course, uh, there will be a consultation between the government and SEBI uh, before that call is taken. That's one. The second aspect that we need to keep in mind also is the fact that uh, probably at this stage, there is no uh, plan on part of the public sector banks to actually uh, do any direct share sales uh, so to speak, uh, you know, PSBs have been raising 
money amply uh, from the markets via the QIP route and uh, you know through that some of the government shareholding has also been coming down naturally. So probably the government here is trying to uh, follow an approach of gradualism or gradual uh, you know uh, gradually bringing down government stakeholding uh, not via direct share, uh, sale of shares but via maybe even the QIP route plus banks should also be ready to raise that kind of money at a certain cost. Uh, and uh, you know they should be needing all that money so put all of this together uh, and another extension is on the cards and we'll have to just wait and watch and see post elections uh, what is the mood in the government uh, will this be revisited at some point in time well that's something that we'll have to wait and watch and see but as of now extension definitely on the cards as far as exemption from the MPS norms are concerned. Thank you, Sapna, for that update. Another CNBC TV 18 exclusive. We learned from sources that Tesla CEO Elon Musk will be visiting India on April 21st and 22nd. Sources also say that there is anticipation of mega announcements during his visit, which includes a two to three billion dollar investment plan. Parikshit Luthra joins us now. Uh, Parikshit, what can we expect from Elon Musk's visit? Well, this is a highly awaited visit, something that the Indian government has been pursuing for years now. Uh, yes, Elon Musk will be in India for 48 hours on 21st and 22nd of April. While the final details of the visit and the schedule are being worked out, we believe most of the time will be spent in Delhi. Whether he'll travel to another city, that remains to be seen. But he is going to meet senior government functionaries. Uh, he will also call on the Prime Minister. There will be some industry events and interaction with industry representatives as well. So what's on the cards? Well, he will announce an investment at a broad macro level for India. This would be to the tune of $3 billion or more. Uh, all of this money will go towards R&D in India, towards setting up a manufacturing plant, which will be completely integrated and will uh, make certain components, critical components of electric vehicles locally as well. Uh, the immediate plan would be to import electric cars from Germany into India, not China, as earlier speculated. And uh, uh, we believe that uh, the, the low-cost cars of Tesla would be brought into India via this route. They will be sold. And uh, this could begin by the end of 2024 or early 2025. Tesla also has a plan to manufacture these cars and export them to global markets after three years too. So... This is one part of it. The other is Starlink. Starlink has been pursuing the Indian government for a license to begin satellite-based broadband services into India. Now, this will be a big one. We believe that almost all decks have been cleared. Approvals are in place by the Indian government. And uh, there could be an uh, important announcement from Elon Musk on Starlink's India plans and India entry as well. So, two big announcements from Elon Musk. Let's see if he spends his time only in Delhi or in another city. But we can tell our viewers that his teams have been scouting for land uh, for manufacturing in Gujarat, in uh, Maharashtra, in Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Uttar Pradesh as well. They're in talks with all these state governments to see where they can get the best deal, the best concessions. Right. Uh, thank you, Parikshit, uh, for those details. Uh, moving on, shares of NTPC briefly hit a 52-week high after its wholly owned subsidiary, NTPC Green Energy, selected four investment banks to manage its initial public offering. As per a report by Money Control, the company has uh, picked IDBI Capital, IIFL Securities, Novama Wealth Management and HDFC Bank. The IPO, which will reportedly be worth around 10,000 crore rupees, is expected to be the largest by a state-owned company since LIC's share sale in 2022. The proceeds from the IPO will be used in solar energy, green hydrogen projects. Sun Pharma was Nifty's top loser in trade today after its Dadra unit received an official action indicated status from the US FDA after an inspection. This means that the facility is considered to be in an unaccept unacceptable state of compliance with regard to current good manufacturing practice. The regulator conducted an inspection from 4th to 15th of December last year and issued six observations to the plant. Sun Pharma has said that it will work with the regulator to achieve full compliance. The Commerce Ministry is likely to seek a further extension of the interest equalization scheme. This applies to both pre-shipment and post-shipment export credit in rupees for another five years. The scheme is set to end on June 30 this year. Abhimanyu Sharma joins us with the details. The Union Commerce Ministry is considering a five-year extension of the interest equalization scheme for exporters. Uh, the scheme 
uh, as of now is slated to end by the 30th of June 2024. Uh, last year in December, the union cabinet had approved an additional allocation uh, to the scheme of rupees 2,500 crores, uh, which is slated to end by the 30th of June this year. And uh, the ministry is considering an extension to the scheme. As of now, evaluation is being carried out and any final decision would be taken only after the report is submitted. Uh, now, uh, this is being mulled on both pre as well as post shipment rupee export credit uh, to uh, promote outbound shipments in view of a good response which has been shown by exporters, by the industry to this scheme. It remains to be seen uh, till what extent uh, this is going to mitigate the problems being faced by exporters in view of a slump in global demand. Now, despite uh, India's exports data uh, moving well in the past few months, there has been a slump in global demand which uh, the exporters uh, to a certain extent have been impacted and it remains to be seen till what extent any such possible move is going to mitigate their problems. Thank you, Abhimanyu, for that update. On that note, we'll slip into a short break. But coming up next, Iran threatens to attack Israel to avenge the death of 11 people, including two generals, in an Israeli strike on the Syria consulate. The US, UK, France, Germany have warned Iran of consequences. More details when we return. Welcome back. You're watching Business 360. Here's a quick look at some other headlines. Iran has threatened to attack Israel after an attack on an Iranian consular building in Syria earlier this month killed seven people, including two Iranian generals. Tehran has blamed Israel for the attack, responding to Iran's warning. Israel said it will retaliate directly to any attack from the country. The U.S. is attempting to deter Iran from carrying out retaliatory strikes. The White House has said that support to Israel's security is ironclad. The U.S. has also restricted movement of its diplomats amid fears of an attack. France has evacuated family members of French diplomats from Iran and warned citizens against traveling to Iran in the coming days. We are prepared both defensively and offensively in a variety of capacities of the army. An attack from Iran's territory will be solid proof of Iran's intention to escalate in the Middle East and stop hiding behind its proxies. What we have made very clear, obviously we've seen the threats uh, coming from uh, Iran, and so we have made ourselves very clear where we stand in supporting Israel's uh, security. That is ironclad. Does that, that does not change. I'm just not going to get into, uh, into details about our operational procedures from here. It's been two years since the alleged front-running scandal at the Axis Mutual Fund came to light. During this period, the fund house has seen turbulent times with many top executives exiting the company and star schemes lagging behind their benchmarks. Shivani Bazaz is here with a deep dive on the impact of the front-running episode on the fund house. Well, Axis Mutual Fund that faced the storm of front-running and price-rigging allegations hasn't been able to stand up on its feet ever since. Access that was once hailed for its performance has struggled to regain its footing in the aftermath of the front-running and price-rigging allegations that surfaced in May of 2022. Two years later, the fund house continues to grapple with the repercussions of the scandal, with its reputation hit and its schemes faltering in comparison to the benchmarks. One year after SEBI released its interim order, Finding irregularities at the fund house, the entire top brass of the fund house has moved out. In the aftermath of SEBI's action, Chandresh Nigam, the then CEO and MD of Access Mutual Fund, resigned from his position, paving way for Gop B. Gopakumar to assume the role of the CEO. In an effort to restore investor confidence, the fund house appointed Ashish Gupta from Credit Suisse as its new chief investment officer. Subsequently, in August 2023, Janesh Gopani, the head of equities, also parted ways with the AMC with Shreyas Davalkar, stepping into that role. The latest to exit the fund house is Raghav Ayangar, the chief business officer of Access Mutual Fund. However, the rejig in the fund management team clearly has not helped the fund house to stage a comeback yet. Top access equity schemes, including Access ELS's fund, Focus 25, Midcap, Blue Chip and others, have failed to stage a comeback. And data reveals that these schemes have underperformed their benchmarks ever since the front-running news came out. In many instances, access schemes languished at the bottom of the return charts across categories, indicating a significant decline in performance and investor confidence. 
Let's take a look at the numbers. Before 2021, most of the access equity schemes were toppers on the return charts. Take a look at 2018 to 2020. All equity schemes are beating the benchmark by a considerable margin. Look at the dip in 2021 onwards and specifically in 2022 where the difference between index returns and the scheme returns are the widest, except for access mid-cap fund. Let's now delve into the impact on the assets under management of Access Mutual Fund in the wake of the front-running and price-rigging scandal and also the poor performance of the schemes. The repercussions were palpable with the fund house witnessing a significant decline in its inflow figures. For the quarter ended March 2022, which was right before the news of front-running at Access became public, the fund house garnered inflows worth 6,331 crores and stood on the second spot among fund houses that saw highest inflows in that quarter. Cut to Q4 of fiscal year 2022-23, Access Mutual Fund saw outflows worth 9,114 crore and stood in the fund houses that saw the most outflows in that quarter. In the second quarter of 23-24, which is the quarter ended September 2023, Access Mutual Fund saw outflows worth 9,543 crores. The quarter ended December 2023, which is the third quarter of the fiscal year 23-24, the fund house saw outflows worth 4,138 crore and stood at the sp second spot in the list of fund houses that saw the maximum outflows. So as of now, the fund house seems to be still struggling with the impact of the case. We would need to wait and watch for how much more time they take to turn the situation around and gain investor trust again. And with that's a wrap on this edition of Business 360 News and Updates. Continue right here on CNBC TV.